Okay, well, let's get started. Um, welcome everyone to uh, today's colloquium, which is a departure from our usual collection of talks about um, you know, chromospheric magnetism and waves in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, today we have uh, Professor Cleland with us. Uh, Carol is a uh, professor of philosophy at the University of Colorado. That's you know, not our usual cup of tea, but we're going to go with it, and this should be a very interesting talk. Um, Oh, this is an old joke. We philosophers are so <laughs> sick of it. <laughs> this is not original. <laughs> um, she is the uh, director of the new Center for the Study of Origins at CU Boulder, and she's been affiliated with uh, the NASA Institute for Astrobiology uh, since its founding. Um, I think I'm going to leave it at that. There's a long um, bio here, but we're interested in your talk, so let's get going. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, I thrilled to be here, and I'm going to try to stay here. I like pacing and pointing, so um, I guess somebody will push me back if I get out of line here. So um, I wish I had had time, but I didn't, to change this picture to a picture of the sun. Why? Because I think most of the people here who are solar physicists are in exactly the same kind of position as an historical scientist. What do I mean by that? I mean they cannot uh, engage in controlled experiments as experimentalists do. They do, are not able to manipulate the environment as experimentalists do. They basically are in this passive position of collecting information that comes to them from the sun, just as an historical scientist is in this passive situation of looking out in the field, if they're, uh, for example, an historical geologist or a paleontologist, for traces of the past. So you're looking, admit it, admittedly, it's only you know seven minutes uh, at traces of the past. Uh, they're looking at traces of the remote past, things that happened 66 million years ago. But really, I think the same arguments that I'm going to give uh, hold here. And I'm really, in, generally, in general, interested in the field sciences. So I'm, and I would consider you guys field scientists. Maybe you don't consider yourselves field scientists. But um, I think I'd be very interested in the discussion just for feedback upon whether you think that the stuff I'm going to talk about uh, seems to apply. The example I'm going to use is um, from historical geology and paleontology, namely uh, the uh, meteorite impact uh, hypothesis for the extinction of the uh, K uh, of the uh, in Cretaceous flora and fauna. So I'm going to use that ex as my illustration. That's a case from deep time. But again, keep in mind, I think you're in a similar, what we philosophers like to call epistemic, having to do with epistemological situation. So with that, I'm just going to start. And I'm eager to hear uh, whether you think you are in a similar position. Hopefully, I can stand here and I can, they can see me. Um, I was told I can't wander too far. So, um, whoops. Why isn't it not working? Hmm. Well, maybe I'll have to. Maybe this will. Maybe this is going to stay here, right? <laughs> that will be interesting. So, um, basically, I don't understand why this is not working. Because I would really prefer. Oh, it is working now. OK. So I'm going to start. Um, this is a kind of an outline of where we're going to give you. Uh, there are a lot of myths about the scientific method that are still really popular. Uh, and philosophers have known for over 70 years that these things don't work. And I'm talking about not only uh, inductivism, um, confirmationism, but also falsificationism. A lot of people don't realize that falsificationism is deeply flawed logically and as a description of the historical practice of scientists and the training of young scientists. But the biggest flaw is the logical one, and I'm going to explain that to you. So we'll spend a little time initially on just why the scientific method of your, meth of your the scientific method of your, as I like to call it, um, really is deeply flawed. And then I'm going to talk about uh, differences in methodology between two different types of science. Classical experimental science, and I call it classical because it involves the testing of hypotheses under controlled laboratory situations. Now a lot of uh, philosophers of science, including our own uh, at CU Boulder, Alan Franklin, have argued that a lot of what goes on in experimental science doesn't fit the model of classical experimental science. Nonetheless, it's going to be my focus because it's the kind of science that's held up as the uh, prototype of good science, and it's the kind of science to which other c disciplines are compared to unfavorably, particularly historical science and field sciences. 
And I'm going to argue that, in fact, um, this idea that somehow classical experimental science is uh, epistemically, uh, there's that word again, uh, superior to um, historical science and the other field sciences of the sort I think that you also engage in, <clears throat> I'm going to explain, <coughs> explain why that view is fundamentally mistaken. <coughs> and uh, that evidence acquired through field work justifies historical hypotheses and the use is of common cause explanation and the search for a smoking gun. These are key concepts to understanding the patterns of reasoning uh, in the historical sciences. So those, that's my goal today. And we'll start with part one, myths about the scientific method. So um, I'm going to start with just talking about inductivism. Inductivism um, goes all the way back to Francis Bacon. It's the view that scientists prove or confirm theories and hypotheses by a logical process of induction. And the basic idea here is that the key of a relationship between data acquired through observation and hypothesis or theory is purely logical. So that's the hope. It turns out uh, that that's just not the case. I think probably all of you know about the problem of induction. Uh, and that's why everybody today is pretty much a falsificationist. Um, but uh, at least uh, why a lot of scientists are falsificationists, philosophers of science are not. So uh, the other view about the scientific method is very popular. By the way, this view is still really popular in K through 12. My students come into introductory philosophy of science, and this is what they were taught. Just, just for a few, could you define what you mean by induction? Yeah, it's the idea that you can prove a hypothesis by a finite body of, de of de evidence. But let me just say a little bit about why that's mistaken. We'll see it more in a minute. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's the problem of induction is how. So the problem of induction is how can you rule out a change in the course of nature? So David Hume argued uh, very eloquently. He was a philosopher uh, in the um, 18th century. Uh, he was the one who first really stated the problem of induction. It was kind of in the air, but he was the one who stated, which is that all you have available to uh, to you is a finite body of evidence. And most of the generalizations that one infers from that finite body of, of evidence are general. They're of the form of all A's or B's. Whether you're talking about F equals MA, Newton's second law, E equals MC squared, all copper expands when heated, they're portrayed and thought of as laws. How are they laws? They're laws because they're supposed to be universal. The problem is the data that supports those laws is always finite. And so you can't prove them as you can prove something in mathematics. Uh, it's a long story. I don't want to get into it. Uh, I want to concentrate on falsificationism because that's the most popular view. But falsificationism is popular because it seems to give you a solution to the problem of induction by sidestepping it. So Popper is the one who's uh, famous for falsificationism. The idea is that you falsify your theories and hypotheses by using empirical evidence to refute them. And I want to give you now the logic of prediction and all of this stuff about confirmation and falsification will come up more clearly. So here's the basic concept. Here's a hypothesis, all C's are E's. Test implication, if X is a C, then X is an E. Test condition is C, you bring about C, and you look for E. So basically your test implication is a uh, prediction, right? That if you have, it's a general prediction. If you have an X and it's C, then you're going to get E. And here's a toy example just to illustrate these concepts. All copper expands when heated. If sample of copper number four is heated, then it will expand. You heat copper sample number four, and it expands. Um, no matter how many, so I think I'm going to, uh, here, you'll see the problem in a minute. So here's a case of ses successful prediction. This is the problem of induction. Um, so you have, if the hypothesis is true, then I, so I'm just going through this, right? Here it is, if x is c. If the hypothesis is true, then I. I is uh, the case. Can you conclude h? Well, no, you can't, because the hypothesis is about all c's and e's, and you've just discovered a single case of c and e. And so obviously you can't conclude the hypothesis is true, because you might have just discovered a case in which it is true, but there are a whole bunch of other cases where it's false, so the hypothesis in general is false. It's like all swans are white. Um, until the discovery of black swans, they had looked at swans all over the world, in the Middle East, in Russia, in Europe, and they discovered not a single black swan. So the probability that all swans were white was thought to be very high, 99.9%, .9%, right? 
But with the discovery of a black swan, we know the objective probability is what? That all swans are white, zero. And that shows you a limitation to statistics uh, because it depends upon whether you've got a representative sample. It depends upon, uh, you can think you have a varied enough sample and you don't. Um, I don't want to go into this because I'm going to focus on falsificationism, but um, the key here, this is the problem of induction, and David Hume is the one who really, a philosopher who most recognized it, um, he recognized that, you know, you just can't do this, and it even is called a logical fallacy. It's called affirming the consequent, where H is the antecedent and I is the consequent, and here we're affirming it. Now here's how, why uh, falsificationism looks so promising, and this is what Popper latched onto. Popper agreed the problem of induction is insurmountable. Um, even if every single case of heating copper uh, has re resulted in it expanding in the past, we can't rule out a change in the course of nature because we can't anticipate the future. So basically, falsificationism sidesteps that. It says that, well, if H then I, not I, now we can conclude not H. This is a valid argument. Uh, it's called denying the consequent because if I say, if all swans are white, then something's a swan, I find, uh, and, and then something is a swan. Now I find, uh, uh, sorry, I find, okay, if all swans are white, then if something's a swan, it should be white. I find a black swan, I can conclude not all swans are white. Looks good, right? Is everybody with me? Okay. Now, here's the terrible truth about falsificationism that philosophers have known for over 70 years. The form of the first premise, if H uh, and the form of this first premise is not, in any real-world test of a hypothesis, correct. This is actually the form. If the hypothesis is true in a whole bunch of what uh, Duham uh, and Quine called, uh, these were both, uh, Quine is a very famous uh, 20th century logician, Duham was both a philosopher and a scientist at the turn of the century, uh, last 20th century, it was a long time ago, um, Anytime you test a hypothesis, it cannot be tested in isolation. It's always assumed a whole bunch of background assumptions. And these are auxiliary assumptions about the test condition. So if you're in a laboratory, you make all kinds of assumptions about the background conditions. And if you're in a laboratory, you can usually control it pretty well. But you can't control certain things, like the phases of the moon. And you assume other things are completely uh, irrelevant, such as the number of pipettes in the drawer. There's just lots of assumptions you make that seem very credible. Uh, that if they were, in fact, false, then whatever result you got, get would be misleading. And so if you actually look at it from this point of view, what you get, this is the form of the argument for falsification. If the hypothesis is true and all of these are true, every one of them, A1 and A2, then I, get not I, now you have to negate not H, which was the key uh, inspiration behind Popper's account, but you have to carry this negation distributed across this and and all these ands. Something called the Morgan's theorem gives you the following result. When you take a not across an and, it turns into an or. So you get not H or not A1 and A2 and A or not H1 or not A1 or not A2 or dot, dot, dot. So any one of these auxiliary assumptions can be uh, appealed to to salvage the hypothesis. And you see this in actual experimental work. What people do is that they never uh, reject a hypothesis on the basis of a single experiment. They say, well, you know, maybe something went wrong with the experiment. Maybe my sample's contaminated. Maybe the instruments aren't working right. And these are all cases where you aim for an auxiliary assumption as opposed to the hypothesis being tested. It's not until you've checked out a lot of plausible auxiliary assumptions that you decide uh, to reject the hypothesis. And the point is, you don't behave like a falsificationist. A falsificationist would reject the hypothesis in the face of a failed prediction. But that's not what scientists do. So um, Pierre Duham, and he was wrote a long time ago, he was both a physicist and a uh, philosopher. He's very famous. He was ignored by Popper. It's a great mystery to philosophers why he was, because he stated this problem, and Popper ignored it. And uh, Willard Van Orman Quine, a very famous logician, um, also stated it in a more general and devastating form. 
Uh, but the point is, from a logical standpoint, no observation, whether experimental or in the field, can conclusively falsify a hypothesis. The emphasis here is on conclusively, for it's always possible to salvage the hypothesis in the face of a failed prediction by denying an auxiliary assumption. And the most important thing is um, that uh, it's not only logically, but historically flawed. Faced with failed predictions, scientists have historically denied auxiliary assumptions. So let's just consider a particularly nice case from the history of science, the perturbations in the orbit of Uranus that led to the discovery of Neptune. When scientists observed that Uranus's orbit didn't fit the orbit described by Newton's theory, they didn't reject Newton's theory. They didn't even think about rejecting Newton's theory. They said, hmm, maybe there's another body at that time, they didn't think there were any planets beyond Uranus. Maybe there's another body beyond, uh, beyond Uranus that is actually responsible for the deviation in Uranus's orbit. And they calculated where that body would have to be and how massive it would have to be, trained their telescopes on the spot, and they discovered Neptune. So this is an illustration of, and the history of science, by the way, this is just a particularly vivid case. But the history of science is just full of this kind of thing. And um, what's really interesting about it is it breaks down in certain cases. So in the case of falsification, um, you look at the perturbation of the orbit of Mercury. They tried for several hundred years to explain the perturbation of the orbit of Mercury in the same way. Initially, it was said to be due to instrumental error. The instruments just were not experimental error. They weren't accurate enough to pinpoint uh, the actual orbit of Mercury with enough detail to be sure that there was this uh, significant deviation. But then what they did is the instruments got better. By the end of the 19th century, things were becoming really um, Mercury's orbit was becoming a real problem uh, for uh, physicists and astronomers. Um, they were really worried about it. Um, so they postulated various things, like the favorite was Vulcan. How many people have heard of Vulcan? Yeah, so they postulated that between basically Mercury and the Sun must be another planet. Just It worked for Uranus, and actually it worked for a lot of other uh, planetary bodies. It was typical response. When Newton came up with his theory of universal gravitation, he couldn't explain, get accurate, most of the orbits. And they were able, through the years, to look at auxiliary assumptions, not to reject Newton's hypothesis. It would have been rejected within a year of its founding, had they really been good falsificationists. But they looked for auxiliary assumptions to, you know, basically to deny that there were uh, any gravitational bodies influencing it, to look for some that could explain it. And Vulcan was a possibility. So they said initially, well, maybe Vulcan is between Mercury and the Sun, and that explains a deviant orbit. But then as instruments got better and we were able to observe things, they couldn't find any planet between Mercury and the Sun. So they said, I love this one, maybe Vulcan has this really weird orbit. The Sun is always between Vulcan and the Earth, so we can't see it. And so they calculated the conditions under which this would be possible. It was kind of bizarre. It had to be a really bizarre planet, but you could do it. You could do it. That's the interesting thing. You can usually do it. And finally, they decided that was a bit ad hoc. So they said things such as, maybe the sun's mass isn't homogeneous. And so when the sun is rotating, it's dragging the orbit because it's lopsided. There were, there's a whole book, and it's buried somewhere. And a student told me about this at the beginning of my career at Boulder, and I wish the heck I had gotten the book. But it's on, uh, basically, uh, hypotheses to explain the deviant orbit of Mercury uh, through, uh, basically, Einstein. And these are all PhD dissertations condemned to the dustbin of history. But the important point is that what they were doing here is this. They were going for these, not this. And so the point here is, this is the point about the history. That's not the way. Uh, scientists don't behave like good falsificationists. And it's inconsistent with the practice of scientists. Uh, laboratory scientists don't reject their hypotheses because they get one uh, you know, failed prediction. And the training of young scientists are not, young scientists aren't trained as falsificationists, as you probably know from having taught students. Uh, when they get they come up to you and I've just falsified, you know, the hypothesis you asked me to test, you say, go back and figure out what you did wrong, right? <laughs> and that means you're training them to do this. 
So the point is falsificationism misrepresents actually how scientists perform uh, their work. Now, why is this important? It's important because science works. I always tell my students, because they all become kind of relativists, that science works. This is the fact. I mean, science has enormous predictive, explanatory, and technological success. You all know that. So because one theory of science doesn't work doesn't mean somehow science is irrational or not objective. It means the story about how science works has got to be more complex. That the simple-minded Popperian and inductivist stories um, are not the right story, just like Einstein is more complex than Newton. And so philosophers of science have been working and struggling uh, with how to understand this now for 70 years. And there are various sophisticated accounts, um, which I won't go into, but I am going to be presenting basically uh, one view about how to distinguish historical and experimental science, uh, which is different than either of these. So the conclusion, Thomas Kuhn, everybody who's a scientist has heard of Thomas Kuhn, right? Yeah. So Thomas Kuhn, who is both a physicist and a philosopher and historian of science, he gives up. He's aware of the problems with Popper, he's aware of the problems with inductivism, and he gives up because he thinks there's no sense to be made of the logical relation between hypothesis and evidence except in either Popper's sense or in the sense of, if you reread re -read him, if you've read him, and you'll see him talking about this and the introduction to his book. He says, you know, it's hopeless. I really wish it were true. I love Popper, but it doesn't work. And so what we see is philosophy of science really changes in the 1960s, the latter part of the 20th century, as philosophers begin trying to understand where things went wrong. And so, yes. Well, I as a way of finding the truth, you're not going to find it. But nevertheless, it's been a pragmatic topic. How useful do you think these things are? I think I think that it it's not as useful as you think, and that's going to come out of what I'm going to say. And I don't think it's that useful because actually scientists don't do it. So it can't be useful if they don't do it. The whole point about Mercury and Uranus is that scientists don't behave like good falsificationists. In fact, what people have often said to me is that nobody talks about falsifying their own hypothesis. They only talk about falsifying their opponent's hypothesis. Yes. Yeah. So, so, uh, so we could I'm going to go and give you an account I think does a better job. Um, but, um, I, but, but I certainly, um, I think this is a really important point because I think that from this kind of picture they get in uh, K through 12 where it's be purely logical and they have to be clever enough to figure out the logical relation between evidence and theory and they can't to a generalization. There are generalizations that you can go from a finite body to a generalization. So um, so if I, I'll move, I did, there was a question back. I, if we get to, I want to move on eventually. Yes. Okay, yeah, no, I, and I'm happy to stick around as long as people want you to answer this. But I just wanted you to have the context because there's just this interesting sort of, shall we say, doctrine or myth about the scientific method which scientists share. And if you actually look at your own practice, you have to have more than one failed prediction before you're impressed. And, you know, on the Popperian view, that's not the case. So I think, so part two, I'm going to talk about what I see as the differences in methodology in classical experimental science and prototypical historical science. I'm going to emphasize historical science, which is what I think actually you guys do under a slightly different name. But I do, I also want to talk about experimental science, partly because the account that I give of classical experimental science, I had many chemists tell me this is what we actually do. So I, I think it's an interesting issue. So the, re, the whole original impetus of this work was uh, the debate over whether or not um, you know, Darwinian evolution is inferior because it's not an experimental science. It, you know, we're ignoring, you know, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, I'm ignoring what they do in microbiology, but the claims about uh, Darwinian evolution are often said to be inferior because, you know, you can't run experiments on, you know, the last common ancestor, et cetera. So um, you often see this in sort of creationist websites. They will say, 
you know, that, histo that historical science is inferior because it can't have the logic of conclusive definition. I have various quotes, just sort of shocking, but that's what they talk about. So I want to now talk about the structure of what I think goes on in classical experimental science. And you can tell me whether or not you think this is more what you do. So focus is on a single, sometimes complex hypothesis, which typically has the form of universal generalizations. Again, I think in the kind of work you do, it's more like historical. You'll see that in a minute. I don't think you work with generalizations about all suns. You work about generalizations about the sun, our sun, which is not the same as all suns. Um, Central research activity consists in repeatedly bringing about test conditions specified by the hypothesis and controlling for extraneous conditions, that is auxiliary assumptions, that might be responsible for false negatives and false positives. So I think the focus is on a worry about false negatives and false positives rather than confirming the hypothesis or refuting it. I think that's exactly uh, what's going on. We can talk about that. Um, and Failed predictions do not result in the rejection of hypotheses. They are best interpreted as attempts to protect the hypothesis from false negatives. What do I mean by that? I don't mean protect your hypothesis in the sense, come what may. I mean, you're worried about maybe my prediction failed because there was some interfering factor. And that's a legitimate worry, right? I mean, interfering factors happen all the time in laboratory research. Second, successful predictions are not followed by risky tests in proper sense. They are best interpreted as attempts to protect the hypothesis from false positives. So you get a positive result. Uh, how do you know it's not a false positive? You want to make sure that a, uh, the um, result is robust. So I think you're testing here robustness in the sense of concern about false positives and false negatives. You want to know whether the generalization uh, is robust in the face of interfering conditions. And those are the things that are going to be elevated to laws of nature. Fragile generalizations are not. And so that's what I think is going on here. And the acceptance or rejection of a hypothesis occurs only after a hypothesis is subject to a series of experiments controlling for plausible auxiliary assumptions that could explain misleading predictive successes and failures. This is what I think is a better description than the classic account of what goes on in experimental science. So I'm going to now move on. Uh, as I said, this isn't the real focus. It's kind of the background against which I want to look at historical science. So here is prototypical historical science. And I'll be curious whether you think this is what you do in your work. Because I think it's like this, even though it's not deep time, seven minute time <laughs> instead. Uh, focus is on proliferating multiple rival hypotheses to explain a puzzling body of traces encountered in field work, effects of bygone events. Central research activity consists in searching for a smoking gun. Uh, this is a term that's used a lot in historical science. A trace that sets apart one or more hypotheses as providing a better explanation for the body of traces thus far acquired than the others. And you see this is quite different than what the experimental method is that I described earlier. And I want to do a case study to flesh this out. And I'm going to focus on the meteorite impact hypothesis for the extinction of the in Cretaceous flora and fauna. It was a two-pronged hypothesis. There was a meteorite impact 66 million years ago, a massive meteorite impact. And that uh, is the uh, triggering cause of the mass extinction event, namely the in Cretaceous uh, mass extinction. Oops. Uh, initially, there were many different explanations for the in Cretaceous mass extinction. They included pandemic, evolutionary senescence, climate change, supernova, volcanism, meteorite impact. I remember when I took a paleontology course, I have an extensive background in physics and geology and chemistry. I couldn't decide what to major in. It's a long story. I had overloads for five years before I finally got a degree in math and then went to grad school in philosophy. So you can see I have a speckled career. At any rate, the important point here is there were initially many different explanations for it. And in my paleontology class, the professor listed these, along with some jokes like big game hunting aliens, which just, I was just, I thought, how can you be you know, flippant about this? I mean, I wanted to know what happened to the dinosaurs. And uh, then he said, which really annoyed me, he said, we'll probably never know. Now, I'm showing my vintage because about uh, 10, less than 10, maybe five years later, it was not very long afterwards, suddenly all of the discussion of these collapsed. They weren't falsified. They just dropped out. 
Nobody was talking about them anymore. The focus was on meteorite impact and volcanism. Nobody talked about this. Nobody talked about pandemic. What do you think about pandemic? Could have had some horrible disease immediately before the mass extinction, uh, the meteorite impact, right? Or immediately afterwards. And you wouldn't find traces of that in the fossil record. So it's not falsification going on here. Suddenly, are being given special significance in virtue of their explanatory power. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Discovery of an iridium anomaly was considered a smoking gun for volcanism and meteorite impact, uh, basically because it narrowed them down. You have the KPG boundary, which is a very narrow um, layer. It is found all over the world. Uh, it marks the end of the Cretaceous and the beginning of the tertiary, or what's now called the Paleogene, the description of the uh, geological record. And Gubbio, Italy, where it was first discovered, it's 30 times background in areas in uh, North America, uh, especially uh, down near the Chicxulub crater, which is now considered ground zero. It's a thousand times background. So what happened here was not a falsification of these others, but how do you explain this enormous amount of iridium in a very thin layer of sediment found all over the world marking the boundary before between the end of the Cretaceous and the beginning of the modern era, or the Paleogene. Very stunning uh, evidence. And the other piece of evidence is that that boundary percent clay. It doesn't have any, uh, you know, there's limestone below. There's eventually limestone above, but it takes a while for recovery. But below, suddenly this big layer of almost 100% clay with an iridium-rich anomaly. That, yes? That doesn't, I mean, I think I'm just supporting your point here. That doesn't narrow anything down. It narrows, it OK. It just provides right? It doesn't but that's, it's, but I want to, that's the, exactly my point. That's why falsification is, no, exactly. It's just evidence. It's positive evidence. It looks more like confirmation than falsification. That's my whole point in answer to your question earlier. Uh, the po that's exactly the point is that why did they suddenly narrow it down here? Well, because they had powerful evidence that these were, uh, and positive evidence, these were the best explanations. Yes, the best, and also explanatory. Also explanatory, because none of this was predicted. The iridium anomaly was not predicted, nor could it be predicted. Why? Because not all meteorites are rich. Only those that are rich in iridium, they're left over from the formation of uh, the planetary system because planet, uh, ast uh, meteorites that are knocked off of, mater of, of bodies that have undergone planetary differentiation have iridium poor um, crusts. So you couldn't have predicted it, and you couldn't have retrodicted it. I'm going to talk about this in a minute. Why? Geological processes scatter stuff, and they concentrate stuff. And some samples are going to be unrepresentative. So there's just nothing like goes on in the classic picture of falsification in these cases. Um, so let me discover extensive quantities of a very rare form of shocked mineral, um, mostly quartz, because there's a lot of quartz in the Earth's uh, surface, since the case for impact over volcanism. And what happens is you find lots of this mineral, primarily quartz, cross-hatched in the KPG boundary. Um, and the only other places on Earth that you find cross-hatch quartz like this are two, the sites of meteorite impacts and also nuclear explosions. Super volcanoes do not produce them. And that was one of the big issues. Initially, when you had the iridium anomaly, some of the volcanologists said, well, it could be coming up from the mantle and the core. And they looked at super volcanoes all over the, they looked at the Deccan Plateau area of India, which was a massive volcanism that was occurring uh, during the time, it actually spans the time of the meteorite impact, um, 65, 66 million years ago. Didn't find any iridium anomaly. The shock quartz was particularly devastating because they found no shock quartz, even with super volcanoes like you find in Yellowstone. So the, cup, the two coupled together provided a smoking gun for volcanism and meteorite impact. It basically converted the impact people. It didn't convert the paleontologists.
paleontologist says, yeah, yeah, so you have a meteorite impact. What makes you think it caused the extinction event? That's the second prong of the hypothesis. They agreed there had been a meteorite impact, but they doubted it caused the in Cretaceous extension. So paleontologists found out across the world looking for evidence of uh, a mass extinction. They weren't looking at dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are big. They aren't fossilized that much. And when you find them, you don't expect to find them right up to the edge of the boundary. You have to have special conditions for fossilization. What they're looking for is tiny stuff. The cl white cliffs of Dover, as you probably all know, are just compacted foraminifera shells. They're basically these little tiny calcareous shells of single-celled organisms. If you take any hunk of the uh, of these uh, massive limestones, you will see just tiny, tiny shells. They're amazing. They have all these different wonderful shapes. And so they were looking to see if on one side of the boundary you had different shells for the foraminifera. They can't look at their genes, obviously. Then you have at the other side of the boundary, and then they look deep into time before the event, you know, back into, and look to see how fast they were changing. What they found is that there was very gradual change throughout the Cretaceous, which is a long period of time, in the foraminifera shells. But um, on the other side of the boundary, the shells were radically different, massively different. They looked at um, you know, ammonites, which are tiny, sometimes really big. And they found ammonite shells uh, in the Bay of Biscay off the French coast, and no ammonites over. Little ones. They're looking at tiny ones, not the big ones. They have huge ones. If you've ever been to England, they have these ones that are just enormous. But they're looking at the small stuff. And they looked at pollen, because as many of you know, the pollen uh, uh, flowering plants came before the end of the Cretaceous. That was like 124, 25, I can't remember how long, uh, a million years ago. So the dinosaurs were cavorting among the flowers. It's always a nice picture, right? Particularly if you know their feathers, you see them when they're bright feathers cavorting among the flowers. I always like that picture of the dinosaurs. But um, you see pollen and fern spores, not a lot, but a lot of pollen. You can actually, it's fossilized. And there's lots of it right up to the edge of the boundary. And then the other side of the boundary, the ferns. The ferns can come back, and falling, uh, flowering plants take a lot longer. And that's exactly what you see. So the paleontologists uh, changed their minds. And they decided, yeah, the evidence is pretty overwhelming that you have a uh, meteorite impact and a mass extinction occurring together. And that just seems like too much of a coincidence. So that is how the reasoning went in the case of uh, the Alvarez hypothesis. And I think what's really interesting about this is that this kind of reasoning um, is really not at all falsificationist. I hope you all see that. It's positive evidence, right? And it's explanatory. That is to say, it's not based on predictions, but on the best explanation for the available body of evidence. So. Um, Lessons from the Alvarez cases. Just go through it. Evaluation of historical hypotheses is not grounded in prediction. I already made that case. Historical predictions are not risky in popper sense. Too many highly plausible extraneous conditions. Iridium poor meteorite. Geological processes of concentration and dispersal. Um, many of you may know that more than 50% of all gold is found in placer deposits. Oh, sorry. I think I've already. Oh, I can be in front of here. Oh, that's good. OK, now I'm happier. Good. Uh, I know. Well, they've been insisting I stand here. So I will. I'm, I'm closer to my water, and this is great. Uh, so at any rate, uh, and then, pardon? Oh, yes. Uh, gold, most of the gold that's found is found in placer deposits. Uh, and those deposits are where the gold was elsewhere, and it kind of runs down from higher levels and collects and settles out in lower levels. So where you find the gold concentrated, it wasn't concentrated in its original source. So that's just an illustration of geological. A lot of minerals are that way. Mineral deposits are from 
you know, what you have is you have smaller quantities. They're washed down into areas of low altitude, and it just settles out, you know, depending on its, and that's where you find it. So it's very interesting that a lot of minerals are found, uh, and gold is one of the obvious ones. And there are also the problem of unrepresentative samples of the KPG boundary. So in Australia, interestingly enough, you have almost no outcrops of the KPG boundary. I've talked to Australians. Nobody talks about this. It's extraordinarily interesting, because Australia has actually got very old. Uh, it's a very old continent. It doesn't have much in the way of, it's got some of the oldest uh, material on Earth, and yet it doesn't have any, doesn't have much in the way of erosion processes. So it's a great mystery. Uh, the Australians can't explain it. Um, Predictions are typically vague, so there's this example. I'm not going to go into it now because I want to get to where I want to go. But uh, Peter Ward uh, made a prediction that he should find Cretaceous ammonites up to the level of the um, boundary off the coast of Spain in the Bay of Biscay. He couldn't find it. He concluded he falsified the hypothesis. And Peter Ward told me the story. It's wonderful. So he ran into, he went back, having claimed to have falsified the Alvarez hypothesis, the second prong of it. He's a paleontologist. Uh, so we went back and he ran into, and this was in the 80s, you know, he runs into first bass separatists with guns on the beach, and then he runs into the remnants of Franco's police with guns, and he goes, I'm getting out of here. He told me he's a coward. So he went up the coast to France, southern France, where basically uh, it's harder to get to it, but there's some nice sea-cut cliffs with very undisturbed, unreworked um, sediments from that, and you have a nice clean KPG boundary, and to his shock, he found ammonites right up to the edge. So what had happened is that the one in uh, Spain, the ammonites in Spain, had undergone some kind of ecological crisis, but continued to flourish up the coast just a couple of miles in uh, uh, southern France. And this illustrates the problem of unrepresentative samples, which is always a threat unless you uh, can run a controlled experiment, right? Um, but you can't do that with things like this. You're dealing with a single event. You're not dealing with generalization. We want to know what happened at the end Cretaceous extinction, not the end Permian, not extinctions in general. We're interested in a particular extinction, just as I suspect you're interested in a particular sun. But we can, I'm just trying to draw analogies, and I'm hoping that you will help me, whether you think this is what's going on. I'm not making any claims. Yes? There is some evidence, I read this in Nature, that... Uh, Although ammonites and others may sharply divide at the KP boundary, the dinosaurs started to die out well before the KP. There, there is a controversy about that. Um, but what's interesting is that a more serious extinction event is one where you get rid of the foraminifera. That's a collapse of the food chain. So even if they were in trouble, and that's really disputed, um, but I've, I've read the same thing. Even if they were in trouble before then, um, you, had, you have some kind of mass extinction on top of that. So it may have been that there was a one-two punch for the dinosaurs. Uh, and, and I actually, if I get to the end of this, I may talk about that. Um, but the important point is that the foraminifera were not going, they go off, they go out right at the boundary level. And when they go out, they, the food chain collapses because they're the base of the food chain in the ocean. You also had a great deal of volcanism that created the Deccan traps in India yes. at about the same time. Yes, but here is the kicker. You have dinosaur nests running through the middle of them. They started before and it continued after. Now, there is an interesting debate about whether or not after this, the volcanism, with the impact, the volcanism increased. There's some int int evidence that the volcanism, which had been going on, uh, actually became worse. Uh, and some people have speculated, you know, you had this kind of reverberation because uh, it hits off the coast of Yucatan and the earth just, you know, reverberates and it makes the volcanism worse. But all of that is consistent with what I'm saying here in terms of methodology. Nothing like falsificationism going on here, which is the take-home point. But I don't think it's less plausible for that. I find this very plausible, that this is a very lightly element, right, in uh, this extinction event. You know, maybe the dinosaurs were going out, whether or not they would have been uh, regenerated, regenerized, I mean, that's not the word I'm thinking. whether or not they would have continued, uh, undergone change, supposing that's right, it's clear, and uh, had undergone evolutionary change and still be with us today, that's not clear if they were just kind of in trouble, right? Yeah. So, but that's a really good point.
So my point here in the case of Ward, that his so-called prediction, he used that word, is more of a um, road map or a recommendation for where you're likely to find evidence of a sort and type, if you're lucky, rather than a real prediction of the kind that Popper talks about, where if you don't get you know, the result E, your hypothesis is in trouble. It doesn't look like that kind of thing. And his fact that he switched so quickly. And again, it's the problem of unrepresentative samples here. And that's the trouble if you're not running an experiment. So hypothesis may be rejected on the basis of evidence that it does not refute. The contagion hypothesis for the incretaceous extinction wasn't refuted, nor was the evolutionary senescence hypothesis. They were just dropped. And people began focusing on volcanism and meteorite impact. The acceptance of a hypothesis did not require a successful prediction. The iridium anomaly was not and could not have been predicted or retrodicted. Again, the problem is the geological process of concentration and dispersal, and the problem that not all meteorites are rich in iridium. Uh, to find an iridium anomaly is evidence of a me meteorite impact, but you don't necessarily expect all meteorite impacts to give you an iridium anomaly. That is why the end Permian extinction of 250 million years ago, people still talk about maybe it was a meteorite. They can't find an iridium anomaly. But that doesn't mean it wasn't a meteorite, right? And so that's another interesting fact. They, they're looking for shock minerals. But again, unrepresentative samples. You go back 250 million years, there's not much in the way of nice, undisturbed outcrops of the uh, end Permian boundary, right? Between the end Permian and the, um, you know, the, um, uh, what is it, Triassic? Yeah. So, valuation of historical hypothesis grounded in explanatory power. They are accepted and rejected in virtue of their power to explain versus predict puzzling bodies of traces discovered through field work. The Alvarez hypothesis explains an otherwise puzzling association, correlation, among traces better than any of its rivals. It is for this reason that it is viewed as confirmed, and its rivals are no longer seriously entertained by scientists. Now, this is, is that the. Open Pardon? Did you say that's open in action? Um, it's, it is uh, in a sense, but, it's, but it, let me continue. I have a different explanation for this. Um, Occam's razor is difficult because you have to define what you mean by simplicity, and people pick and choose their own criterion of simplicity. So that's the problem with Occam's razor. I have another alternative, which I want to talk about now. Common cause explanation and the search for a smoking gun. Uh, this is going to be, um, this is the, so, so this brings us to common cause explanation. So there, yeah, it is very much. No, I think this is detective work. I think it's very much what goes on in, uh, you know, in detective work. So, uh, but it's different in the sense, I think it'll become clear in a minute. But So there's this thing called the principle of the common cause in philosophy. Uh, the philosopher uh, Reichenbach, Hans Reichenbach, uh, is the one who gave us this principle. He stated the principle. It says basically, he said it was a principle that seemed to be operational in our reasoning about uh, the past that seemingly improbable associations, they can be correlations like iridium and shock quartz, or similarities uh, like the feathers in dinosaur wings, and, and dinosaur, dinosaur bodies and the feathers in, uh, on birds, right? Uh, similarities and correlations uh, among traces are best explained by reference to a common cause. And so the idea here is that a common cause, event back in time, leaves many different effects in the present. And these effects are what um, historical scientists use in reasoning back here. And they don't need all these effects. I'm going to talk about this in a minute. There are so many that you only need a small portion of these in order to infer to a past cause. And what's interesting from a philosophical point of view is this presupposes that the time structure of causal relations in our universe have a particular character. Most, if not all, events form open forks from the past to the future leave many traces in the future. Now, if events were different, if in fact we had massive overdetermination of uh, events in the present by the past, as the forks open the other way, like in a firing squad, in a firing squad you overdetermine a death. Backup systems are designed to overdetermine uh, 
things. Human beings act over determined events because we know this is a problem, right? That is to say, if the universe were such that there were in nature, nature had all these backup systems, um, then you wouldn't have a principle of the common cause. You couldn't reason in this way. Or if all causes had a single effect, which is a logically possible world, we philosophers like talking about that kind of thing, then you couldn't reason like this, right? But the fact is, we have lots of stuff produced by events in the past that give us traces to reason about the past. And that is the key difference, I'm going to argue, between the historical sciences and the experimental science. Uh, and here's the key. Is there any reason to believe the principle of the common cause is true? I've just told you if this is true, we're in business, right? But do we have reason to believe this is true? The answer is yes. It's called the asymmetry of overdetermination. The philosopher David Lewis gave it this name. But you are all going to recognize it as physicists. It's really well known. Uh, most local events and structures overdetermine their past causes because the latter typically leave extensive and diverse effects and determine their future effects because they rarely constitute the total cause of an effect. And the best way to think about this is how much easier it is to infer an ancient volcanic eruption, even the Deccan Plateau volcanism, compared to being able to uh, predict the next eruption in Mount St. Helens. It's so much easier to go back in time, right, than to predict the next eruption of Mount St. Helens. That's really interesting. And the physical source, this is what you all recognize, um, is very well known to physicists. It characterizes all wave phenomena, the radiative asymmetry, which characterizes water waves. Here's an example. And also, uh, of course, uh, uh, radiation and light. Particles, second law of thermodynamics. Phenomena above the quantum level. Quantum level is a problem. I don't want to go into it, but you could probably guess why it's a problem because the, the laws are, yeah. And it's an objective and pervasive physical feature of the world. So if you drop a pond into a uh, rock into a pond, ripples spread out. And you don't need, if you want to reconstruct where the rock fell into the pond, you don't need the whole, all the rings. You can piece it together by just looking at little pieces here and there. If a boat goes off on this side, it rains on this side, you can still piece together where it fell, where it came in, just by piecing together the ripples. You can take a piece here and a piece here, just a metaphor. Volcanic explosions are particularly uh, interesting. They throw out all this junk, ash, pyroclastic debris, etc. And they physically, not logically or strictly metaphysically, sorry, ground the principle of the common cause and the methodology of historical natural science. So the important point I'm trying to make here is that Popper and all these other people thought the relation between evidence and hypothesis was logical. I'm arguing it's not. It's based on physical features of the universe. That's what scientists are exploiting. And I'm going to argue even experimentalists exploit that. So here's a lovely picture of Mount St. Helens before and after. Look at the changes. Here's water. Here is mud that has filled that in. Look, the mountain's got a chunk taken out of it. A lot of these uh, trees and things have been knocked down. Uh, they will become fossilized. There'll be tons of evidence for future volcanologists 100 years from now, 100 million years from now, uh, to reconstruct what happened here. And that is due to, so, oh, I don't want to go back that far. All right, sorry. That is due to the asymmetry of overdetermination. And the asymmetry of overdetermination does not guarantee that every improbable association, this is uh, the Reichenbach point, among traces is due to a last common cause. It's statistically a probabilistic claim. Uh, the asymmetry of overdetermination does suggest that probable associations among traces, like iridium and shock quartz, or the feathers on dinosaurs and the feathers on birds, are likely to be a result of a common cause. In the case of dinosaurs and birds, a common ancestor. In the case of iridium and shock quartz, a meteorite impact. This is what I think historical scientists are looking for. I think they're using the principle of the common cause to look for puzzling associations, similarities, and correlations in the present that really can't be explained readily in terms of separate causes. And if you can't explain them in terms of separate causes, the most reasonable inference is to a common cause. In the absence of special theoretical or local background information, uh, we're, I'm running out of time, so we can talk about that later if you want. Historical natural scientists exhibit a preference for common cause over separate causes explanations. Uh, and I'm going to 
go through this. Uh, so I think I'll stop here. But um, I want to make a point about um, experimental science. So I think you can understand experimental science in this sense also, because what experimental scientists have is are in a very different evidential situation than historical scientists. Experimental scientists, there are no records of the future. There are only records of the past. Historical scientists exploit this when they are looking at for correlations in the present, because they, they have good reason, similarities, good reason to believe that when they proliferate their multiple hypotheses, that there will be, if they haven't discovered it yet, a smoking gun for discriminating among them is in the field somewhere to detect. Experimentalists always have the worry of interfering conditions, those auxiliary assumptions. And so they are always trying to circumvent the underdetermination of the future, the prediction, by their test condition. Because take, for example, if you say a short circuit causes a fire, there are all kinds of other factors that have to be present. Most of them known, in that case it's simple, oxygen, flammable material, etc. But in any experiment that you're doing in a lab, there are just lots of things that you don't know might, which might be interfering. The equipment, uh, there are, I wish I had time to tell you wonderful cases, such as uh, Tom Cech's discovery of uh, self-catalytic RNA. Um, he didn't believe his results initially. It was really wonderful because he didn't believe his results initially. Why? Because he was sure there was a protein contaminant. He got results and what he thought was a uh, pure sample of RNA where he didn't have any protein and he kept getting catalytic results. But that violated basically um, the principle that uh, you have this division between proteins and nucleic acids. And, Basically, um, you know, you have the proteins are the catalyst and the nucleic acids do the uh, hereditary stuff. And so he couldn't understand how in a sample of what he thought was pure RNA he was getting catalytic pro products. And uh, he tried all kinds of ways to remove it. There are just tons of cases from the history of science where that kind of thing goes on. And sometimes you're right, there is an interfering condition you didn't think of, and sometimes you're wrong. The important thing is you're in a really different evidential situation if you're a scientist looking towards the future and testing a generalization than if you're a scientist looking toward the past and you're interested in a particular event that occurred a long time ago or even seven minutes ago, I would think. So I think I'll stop there just because I, don't, I do want you to have time to ask questions, which I think I might have already run out of. We will take some questions, so shoot. Charlie, you had a question earlier, so. So, so yes, lovely question, and I would have covered it if I had time, so let me answer that question. So biology is an exception here, because in biology we know uh, that there's such a thing as convergent evolution. That is to say, not all biological similarities are due to a common cause. Uh, the wings of insects and the wings of birds would be an example of that. 
Uh, and so in biology, and somewhere I put theoretical reasons. I can't remember where that was now. Um, I think I had it here, theoretical. Here it is, yeah. So uh, in biology, because we know there is convergent evolution, we have special theoretical reasons for worrying that these kind of similarities are actually misleading. And so in the case of the dinosaurs and the birds, it's not just the wings. It's a whole bunch of other factors. And this, again, is the multiple lines of evidence business. So in the case of the dinosaurs and the birds, uh, it's wonderful. They have discovered, and this is uh, the most striking thing I think that they have discovered, is that they have, uh, I don't know that there are air, uh, that bird lungs are uh, basically their bones are full of air sacs. Uh, dinosaurs, some of the dinosaurs have air sacs just like the birds. And so the discovery of, there's also the discovery of a four chambered heart in a dinosaur um, that was fossilized which uh, is consistent with only birds and mammals, not reptiles. So initially, dinosaurs were classified with crocodiles because they had certain similarities with crocodiles. But when they began looking more closely at the fossil record of the dinosaurs, it wasn't just discovery of feathers. It was discovery of a whole bunch of other factors that were so bird-like that it would make uh, the similarities be just such an utter miracle for a coincidence. And that is what led to the reasoning, because of course we don't have genealogical evidence of the dinosaurs and the bird similarities. But it's not just one thing, it's like the iridium and the shock quartz, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff in the KPG boundary, such as glassy spherules, a rain of fire, uh, and tektites, and all of these other meteorite impact material that's just concentrated in the KPG boundary. So it's a really good question that you've asked. And uh, we have special theoretical reasons to worry about convergent evolution, and people do in the case of biology. And there are also local background factors uh, that you might bring into play uh, and worry about. So uh, these are all, shall we say, conditions that have to be dealt with before you conclude that a, uh, an association uh, is likely to be due to a common cause. They're defeaters, as it were, for that. So I hope I, did I answer your question? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I wanted to talk about it, so I really thank you for the question. Thank you. Well, I wish I could, I would, I'll stay as long as anybody wants to talk to me. Although I have to meet somebody at four, so I can't stay sure. too long. Yeah, go ahead. Do I have to be in the? Do I still have to be over here? No. no, no oh, okay. Great. Right. Um, let me uh, let me just say I actually think that what you don't do is what you say you do. That is to say, part of my argument here is if you look at cases of successful science, such as the resolution of the cause of the in Cretaceous extinctions, what I'm claiming is this describes what actually went on in the resolution, and it wasn't a matter of falsification. Uh, they, some people talk about that. Powell wrote a book, it's a wonderful book. It was before my um, papers came out, it was in the 1990s. Uh, it's called When Night Comes to the Cretaceous. I recommend it, it's out of print, but it's uh, he was there, He, uh, I'm sure you can find it. He was actually involved in all of this, and he describes the discovery, uh, I mean, he describes how this debate, uh, he gives, talks about the multiple hypotheses, how they finally narrowed it down to volcanism and meteorite impact, and then he tries to portray it as a case of falsification. But if you actually read it, it's not what he's doing. Uh, he makes all these claims about, well, they, here are four cases where they tried to falsify it. 
And if you look at it, it's not falsification. He's not trying to reject it. He's confused about it. So what I'm claiming is that if you actually look what sci at what scientists do and not what they say they do, they're doing this. And I think the same is true with uh, experimental work. Experimentalists you know, claim to try to falsify their data, but they never reject it until they have gone through the plausible auxiliary assumptions that could have interfered with it which is exactly what Tom Chick did when he took, you know, he, so when, when he was trying to figure out whether, he thought, he, and as he said now in his Nobel, I love Nobel speeches because they really tell you how the scientist thought. He's secure enough to tell you how he's thinking. And so in his Nobel speech, Tom Chick says he was so embarrassed that he would go in, sneak into his lab so his postdocs wouldn't see him. Uh, and try to figure out what was going wrong with the experiment, because there was clearly something wrong with the experiment. There was a protein contaminant in there. And so he said he, he used detergents, he boiled it, he even, he said, had what he now realizes was the ridiculous hypothesis. Uh, he said that it was covalently bonded, that the protein was covalently bonded to RNA. And he says now that was a ridiculous hypothesis. But he was so resistant, right? But what he's doing is not anything like falsification. What he's doing is trying to figure out, you know, what auxiliary assumption is wrong. So what I would argue is that um, that people talk this way, but that's not what they do. And uh, what I would argue is that scientists, I think, would be better off if they thought of it this way. Maybe I'm wrong, uh, rather than doing that. So that's kind of the argument I'm giving. Yeah. So, so let me just say where I think falsification is pathological. The debate over the Allen Hills meteorite that was supposed to have fossilized Martian life is a classic example of that. Uh, so what uh, McKay and Gibson, who were the PIs in that experiment, do everybody know about that case? Yep. Okay. So, so the McKay and Gibson were the PIs for that experiment, and they said, well, look, we found these carbonate globules and uh, you know, these really interesting magnetite crystals that look just like the ones you find in magnetotactic bacteria. Uh, so they listed these, this evidence and said, you know, this might be, they didn't say it was, uh, although they were misrepresented as saying it was, this might be evidence of fossilized Martian life. And suddenly all of these people are saying they didn't try to falsify their hypotheses. Their careers were almost ruined over this because they didn't try to falsify their hypotheses. I remember talking to impact specialists who were just disparaging disper of these guys because they didn't weren't proper falsifications. Part of uh, this work I've done came out I was just so appalled. They had a wonderful Time Magazine uh, uh, article in those days when they actually cared about science, and they had a picture on the front that's talked about the war of the words. So it said as a war, war of the world. Now there's a case where I think um, if you actually read McKay and Gibson's article, they dug in later, by the way, because they were being attacked. But their original article is much more, yeah, here's a bunch of lines of evidence. I think it was perfectly reasonable that these were lines of evidence. And now, you know, the question would, can you make these magnetite crystals abiologically? Could they be, and there's some evidence now that they can be made uh, in uh, high energy and high, you know, temperature and and high pressure impacts. So, you know, that's perfectly reasonable kind of reasoning, but everybody jumped on them over this falsificationism. That's the kind of case where I think uh, it's really unfortunate. So that's why I think that falsification, being too simple-minded a falsificationism, a falsificationist can be damaging uh, and it can ruin careers. So at any rate, that was my answer. I want to give Kevin a chance and Ricky, because you had your hand up earlier. Yeah. No. Yep. Yeah, go. Sure. Sorry. The, so the, the difference between experimental and this historical science is one has this seems better because it has this predictive power in the experimental, whereas the explanatory approach of the historical. Yeah, that's the way I'm portraying it. Right. And I mean, arguably, you could have predicted that a meteor impact, a certain type of meteor impacting in a certain parts of the globe, would produce an iridium layer. And, you know, it could have been predicted. But nobody would have thought that way. But it seems a lot of the, you know, you could put a lot of effort into predicting a lot of things. Right, exactly. The advantage exactly. of historical 
approach using an explanatory uh, method is it's more efficient to it, wait until you find some kind of anomaly, something that needs, you know, that may be discriminatory, and try to work backwards and find that. Comment. But the nice thing is, when you find something, they find things that are mysterious all the time. They proliferate alternative hypotheses, right? Which I think is the right way to go, because now you have the plausible hypotheses, and now you have a background to ghost hunting for a smoking gun, which are most plausible. So, for example, for um, for uh, um, supernova, uh, they would ex they looked for a particular kind of uh, isotope. I think it's a, a plutonium that you expect a supernova explosion, and they didn't find it in the KPG boundary. So you know they they had a bunch of hypotheses that were plausible. Uh, that they could look for evidence for, and they could they discover new ways of looking for it. Yeah. But aren't those examples of falsification? Yeah. No, because what they okay, so that's a good point. So in the case of so that's a really good point. So they're yeah. No, he was actually trying. He was trying to find the. So, but he was he was trying to find. Um, what was responsible for the problem, but he wasn't trying to falsify the key hypothesis, which was that uh, RNA was not self-replicating. That was what he was holding constant, because he just couldn't believe that RNA was not self-replicating. Well, you you could portray it that way, but I think it's that's not the natural way to portray it, because if you if he had really been trying to falsify it, he would have falsified it immediately because he couldn't find the protein, right? And it wasn't then the covalently bonded stuff was a very unreasonable hypothesis. But your point's a good one about the plutonium. I think maybe it's fair to say that sometimes I have to think about that one. Sometimes it looks like that, but I think in general um, that this kind of picture is often the way in which things are being done. Uh, it's certainly the case if you look at so with the plutonium, I mean, you might. So I, I would I would have difficulty with arguing with you about the plutonium case. But the lo other cases, like the pandemic, the evolutionary senescence, they certainly weren't falsified. And the climate change weren't falsified. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, very nice talk. So Thank you. The first thing that you asked a couple of times, like whether solar physics. Uh, yeah, I was just curious. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about things like the sun is a, a plasma physics laboratory where, because we, we focus a lot on recurring events, right? So solar flares, coronal mass ejections, things that happen time and time again. So you, you can come up with a model for them and, uh, and then you sort of test your model against the future observations. So can I just interrupt you? Models are not the same as the system. So I actually, I'm really interested in the use of models, both in climate science and in uh, historical science because they're kind of proxy experiments. They're not really experiments because junk in, junk out, right? If you haven't got the right factors in the model, then the model won't represent the world. But I, but I think that, um, but I think a lot of the kind of near present sorts of historical science, you know, seven minutes away type of historical science, involve modeling, and and I, I that's one of the reasons I wanted you to think about that because I think modeling is really interesting, and I'm not, but yet, but I think it's really important not to confuse the model with an experiment because it's not an actual experiment, right? right. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Then, and personally, I think of I, I use other stars in my. In my in you use what? Other stars. Uh huh. And so some of the things I do try to generalize, and I mm -hmm. think of the other stars as other experiments. Um, and I think we're a lot of us are attracted to this field because. This, it's, a, it's an area of astrophysics that is the closest you can get to experiment. The sun can be observed mm -hmm. very well, where right? mm -hmm. uh, other kinds of objects are much more difficult. And then I wanted to, something that I've had on my mind, uh, other areas of, of, uh, of physics are getting further and further removed from, from experiment. Yes, they are. And, and String uh, theory. <laughs> exactly. Uh, in late December of 2014, I found this comment to nature where they're talking about uh, string theory and this multiverse uh, and, and many paths, quantum mechanics and things like that. And the guy was defending um, basically the old way of doing things. But the, the proponents are saying if a theory is sufficiently elegant and explanatory, it need not be tested uh, experimentally. You know what we that philosophers no call that? We call it bad metaphysics. 
That's, that's what we <laughs> philosophers call it, bad metaphysics. Because once you cut your ground out from underneath you, you're no longer tying it into uh, experiment, uh, then you're doing metaphysics, which is what, there's a whole domain of philosophy that does metaphysics, which is very logic driven, by the way, interestingly enough. When you think of metaphysics, you think of yogis and things, the kind of stuff that goes on in the academic world is very much like what goes on in formal, high-level mathematics. And one of the reasons I do philosophy of science, I suddenly realize how meaningless it was just to do logic. Uh, so yeah, I think you're right. Uh, well, I think I think uh, there's an actually it's been several interesting articles written that I have my introductory students read uh, by physicists on how contemporary physics uh, needs more philosophy because they've gotten so far removed from the empirical base and they don't really know what they're doing. So it's an interesting question uh, because again it's just consistency, logical and mathematical consistency, right, with data. So a string theory is a really interesting case since it has no empirical evidence and it is gives you no new predictions. That is to say, it unifies general relativity and quantum mechanics and has exactly the same predictions as those two theories do by themselves, but through a mathematical tour de force, it unifies the two. Is that enough to make it uh, truly solve the, you know, the problem that Einstein was so worried about, a unified field theory? Seems to me very, I mean, there are gauge theories. There are lots of other possibilities, right, in terms of trying to find unity. Uh, and so, the question is, is it progress? I would say, unless you can have it, so as a philosopher of science, I think it's really important for science to be able to, there to be an empirical difference, a detectable empirical difference. That's just my perspective as a philosopher of science. And I think if you don't have a detectable empirical difference, that um, unless you have an especially brilliant argument, which there are many different versions of string theory, there's not just one, I think, uh, and some philosophers of science disagree with me, so I'm just opinionating here, I think that um, if you don't have an empirical difference, it's metaphysics, and not physics, that's what I would say. All right, and with that, I'm going to close the, uh, the official colloquium. You can stay around for another, I don't know, 25 minutes or so. Um, I do have to leave to meet somebody at Chautauqua, but I'll hang around. And, well, I think I got here really early, so that person can wait. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you. There is, however, another aspect.